this is uh, simply an, a diagram of our digital outreach. Um, it shows uh, you know, how many email subscribers we have, 4,144. How many unique visitors there have been to our website since March the 1st, um, 12,400 plus. Um, and it shows that we've added uh, YouTube and we've added um, LinkedIn to our group of digital assets. Um, we've answered over 50 questions on our website on our Ask the Bay feature. If you haven't tried it, I welcome you to come on the um, baysarasota.org website and uh, join the conversation. Um, we've placed over 100 videos on the website and uh, we, over 15,000 people, have um, watched one or more of those videos. This is uh, where we are on the YouTube videos, 2, 000, almost 2,900 views, 5,800 minutes, and you can see the other numbers. With Facebook alone, we've reached almost 33,000 people. Obviously not 33,000 different people, because some of you come back, um, but 33,000 in total and almost 15,000 unique views. Um, the reason I mention this is that we are going to do our best to reach everyone in the community who has any interest in this initiative to encourage them to join in the process and join in the dialogue because that's the best guarantee that what we end up recommending and what the city ends up approving and what we both end up implementing will meet the needs and wants of the community in which we live and work. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce Bill Waddell and the team that's gonna take you through uh, the plan, the process, and uh, tonight's meeting. Bill. Thanks, AG. Uh, again, everybody, welcome. Appreciate you coming out. Um, to, before we get into the meat of the presentation, I'd like to recognize a few folks. Uh, I saw the mayor, uh, Liz Alpert, is here. She's a new ex officio member to our Bay Park Conservancy Board. And the vice mayor was over here. She's now over there. Welcome, Jenna Hern-Koch. And then I saw four members of our volunteer Bay Park Conservancy Board, Kathy Layton, Cynthia McCaig, Rob Lane, and I think I saw Rod Hirschberger. Anybody else that I missed of our board? Thank you, uh, and these are, these are all volunteer members. They've, they've put in a lot of time uh, and energy, so we certainly appreciate that. Okay, we'd like to talk a little bit about where we've been, and then Gina and Susanna are going to talk about where we're headed, talk about a phase one, our phase one uh, process and design update, and then we're gonna take uh, questions and try and answer them. Uh, like past meetings that we've had, hopefully all of you that came in got two sheets, one a blank index card, that we'd like you to write any questions down on. We'll collect them uh, when we get to the Q&A period, and that helps us do a couple of things. One, it makes us sure we uh, make sure that we document every question that we get, and then we can post any answers that we don't get to on our website, because that's certainly an important thing uh, to us as a part of our process. Um, and then the second thing that you should have is a sheet that's a very short survey that we're asking a couple questions about uh, uh, to give us your feedback about related to the phase one plan. Um, that survey actually after today's uh, workshop uh, will be available online as well. And so anyone that's not here tonight, anyone that's watching online on Facebook Live can fill out that same survey. And then anyone can always ask us questions as AG said on askthebay.org and uh, we'll answer those uh, on, uh, through the videos. Okay, so this process, I get folks sometimes say that this process is moving uh, incredibly fast. Um, Bayfront 2020 actually formed back in 2013, six years ago, and so it took us uh, six, almost six years to get a master plan. And so uh, I'd say we're moving at a, at a um, uh, I'd say now we're moving at a pretty good pace, but uh, Bayfront 2020 formed in 2013. Uh, uh, they collaborated with the city of Sarasota to create a uh, series of six guiding principles that were adopted by the city commission. And those include uh, aspiration, uh, where we can imagine together the possibilities uh, for the bay, recognizing the amazing existing bayfront and natural assets that we have to create a blue and green oasis, connectivity and the importance of connecting our community and our neighborhoods uh, to a site that is accessible to all, uh, 
activating this site in a way that it creates an enlivened destination and a gathering place for our uh, families and our community to come together and have fun. Cultural heritage, respecting the cultural vitality and the heritage on both this site as well as uh, in the city, uh, in the broader city. And then lastly, sustainability, and that's not only uh, environmental sustainability, but economic sustainability in perpetuity for this great park that we're uh, going to be building and maintaining. Uh, so the Sarasota Bayfront Planning Organization was formed in two, uh, 2016 to hire a firm uh, to do a uh, master plan. Um, over 22 uh, proposals were received. Ultimately, the uh, agency Sasaki team was selected, and they went through an almost year process to create a master plan, which was approved in September of last year. The last piece, uh, and this is actually the master plan, you can see to the left is the existing conditions of our site, 53 acres, largely uh, a parking lot today, and the, in the approved master plan uh, that will be largely a green, open, accessible park uh, once completed. And then uh, in uh, April of this year, we received sort of the last major piece that we needed to proceed, which was the approval of our long-term partnership agreement that is for a minimum of 15 years, uh, but uh, when we do what we say we're going to do, hopefully it will uh, survive in perpetuity and we'll fundraise for, uh, implement, and operate uh, a great park on this 53 acres. So that brings us to today. So this is an ongoing conversation we're uh, continuing to have with our community. We've moved from the master plan phase, which is a very high level document uh, that had community consensus on the components that will be in the park. We have spent the last six months doing a lot of technical uh, uh, surveying, including bathymetric surveys, mangrove surveys, uh, seagrass surveys, topographic and tree surveys, all of that has informed the preparation of our phase one design plan, and Gina is going to talk more about that. And then that process, uh, this process moving forward is about seven, eight, maybe nine months for us to get to the point where we have an approved phase one plan to then do our construction documents, submit for building permits, and go to build the park. So we've got about seven or eight months here where we're going to be facilitating this community conversation. Um, this first phase. Today we're, have, we're hosting, this is the second of, uh, of a couple of community workshops. On Monday we'll have a city commission workshop where they're not taking any action. We're just soliciting feedback on our draft implementation plan. In August we're hoping for uh, a revised uh, implementation plan that gets approved by the city commission to move forward and then do the site plan application process which includes three additional community uh, uh, workshops, a community workshop at the beginning, and then planning board and city commission workshops. Uh, that, those will be in January, February of next year. So again, we've got about seven or eight months, and one thing I'd like to point out is, as AG said, we've had uh, over almost 200 meetings as a part of our process so far, and a normal park project like this or a development project would require uh, three community meetings through the site plan application process, and we're hosting seven. And so we're trying to make sure that we do a good job of, of soliciting community feedback and representing what we're hearing from the community, ultimately for uh, the city to approve uh, as we move forward and implement. And so I'd like to turn it over to Veronica for a moment. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Veronica Brady. I'm the Director of Advancement for the Bayfront uh, Bay Park Conservancy. And uh, I wanted to share with you a little bit about where we are in terms of funding the initial phase one. Because as many of you have heard, we are relying on philanthropy to do the majority of the funding for phase one. And I wanted to thank some of our initial partners. The Charles and Marjorie Brancic Foundation uh, granted almost a million dollars for us to begin work on the mangrove area. And Bill is going to uh, share an update on that and tell you where, how we're progressing. Then each of you should have received a flyer as you came in. Uh, the Patterson Foundation has challenged us to raise the $15 million. They've given us an initial $2 million grant and then will give us a million dollars every time we raise another $5 million. And we are incredibly grateful to them for their generosity. And then hopefully some of you saw our announcement that we had received an unrestricted $2 million gift to the Bay. 
And yesterday, uh, we received word that a family foundation was adding another million dollars to our efforts. But all gifts, it's incredible. There have been many, many other donors, those who helped us fund the initial master plan, and those who have contributed in this process so far. And we hope you'll join us, because it really will take our community coming together to bring this park to fruition. Thank you. And so now I'd like to turn it over to uh, Gina and Susanna to give us an update on phase one. Hi, everyone. You can hear me okay. Yeah? Okay. Thanks. Okay, hi. So some of you might remember me and my colleague, uh, Susanna Ross, from our many, many public meetings and our fans in the front row. <laughs> Uh, we have gone through an incredible master planning process and this is a really exciting moment where we start now transitioning into how to realize our phase one. When you go from a master planning vision for 53 acres to something that's landing in real space and time, things change a little and adjust to more accumulated knowledge and so I want to walk you through where we are at the very beginning of a design process for phase one, how we've already started to adjust um, ideas to, to real grounded information and uh, some of the things that we'd like from you in terms of feedback. So as we uh, contemplate this site, which I think many of you know is the site on the northern edge of uh, our northern side of Boulevard of the Arts, uh, here reaching to the bay, um, we move from master planning, which is high level visioning, into thinking about real place and space. And so as part of that, we've accumulated an incredible consultant team of experts in everything from uh, ecology and engineering and architecture and um, uh, electricity, MEP consultants, the whole range of technical experts to help us bring this park to fruition. As part of that process, we green hatted. Do you guys remember green hats? Yeah, big, visionary, bold ideas about the place. We site walked to really get to know the phase one property in tangible detail. We had experts explain the local ecology and uh, issues of the site. And we did a lot of sketching to think through um, what the possibilities were. And as part of this work, uh, we revisited the program that was established in the master plan. The master plan um, called for a series of program pieces. Um, primarily, let's remember, it was about this idea of a living and learning lab, an experimental first phase where we could really invite people and welcome people to the Bay in a free and accessible way and test ideas about new uses and program uh, to see what really sticks with this community and what makes us excited. As part of that, we had established a series of ideas that there would be plazas that would welcome people and great pedestrian environments to connect from nearby neighborhoods to the bay, uh, that there would be a pier or an overwater experience that would start to connect people spiritually, physically to this incredible water sheet and the life on it, that we have this really unique northern border of phase one that's the mangrove inlet, which is a unique and lovely ecology with a whole host of experiential and interpretive opportunities, so we thought about that. Uses have been a kind of ongoing conversation. We'd love to hear from you as you see phase one, what are the kinds of uses you can imagine? What, what is this exciting and, and igniting in your uh, imagination about what you and your family and your friends would do in this space? We've been thinking of some of those. And then services. How do we make sure that this park actually offers people the kind of basic things that they need to enjoy a park? Restrooms being front of mind, enough parking, um, and, uh, and some level of food and beverage that's sustainable and flexible. This was how those elements landed in the previous master plan. This was the phase one concept with the white boundary, as you can see, in a dashed line. So you see all those elements, shaded spaces, food and beverage, some limited amount of parking, um, a pier. In this case, we had two piers and two new bridges that crossed over the mangrove. But what we've been discovering, um, first, we, we have been working with a really rich um, environmental and ecological series of teammates who have given us a really in-depth survey of the ecological resources for this site in particular. And so what you're seeing here in the kind of olive green um, are, the is the mangro are the mangrove, um, the mangrove inlet, and the planting associated with that. So we want to be very delicate about that landscape. The sea grasses, which are beds of grasses that predominantly run along the coastline, but also, as you can see, they're in the mangrove as well. 
it can't be overstated how significant and meaningful seagrasses are to the Bay's ecology. Um, we understand that they are uh, the foundational plant species of the Bay and its rich ecology, and uh, we also recognize that pollutants and change um, and human impact and urbanization has really threatened them, and so every square foot of seagrass we can preserve, um, the better and also the more we can invite people to understand and see them and respect and steward them, the better. So, and then we have little bits of coral here and there which are also sensitive but uh, also kind of rich resource for the plan. So that kind of shows you a little bit of what we learned. You'll notice this area right here. This is actually a naturally occurring beach. Not like the beach out on Siesta Keys. This is a rocky, shelly, seagrass-filled, ecological beach. Um, and the city has done a brilliant job of building a new uh, living breakwater, which is a kind of uh, revetment that enables all kinds of marine life and also prevents erosion. This is that existing, I'm sorry, it's a little dark. Imagine, if you will, a rocky, craggy, seagrassy-filled, uh, naturally occurring beach where sand has accreted. Uh, you see the living breakwater, which are a series of kind of uh, revetments out in the water. You also see, as you look at that existing resource, just to the back, an eroded bank where the um, kind of the lawn and uh, the beach are emerging in an uncomfortable way. So we have erosion happening here, something we can address by laying this slope back and creating kind of a uh, better grading situation for big storm events. Here's the living shoreline, and it's recently completed with signage. So these are developments that were, have been actually under construction since the master plan was adopted in September of last year. And so a changing context uh, that we were aware of, but now actually has come to fruition. So as we think about that, and we think about having this more information about the um, ecological condition, understanding a little more kind of the mangrove inventory and how that um, arrays on site, and this beach and living breakwater, it caused us to challenge some of our uh, assumptions in our master plan. So here you see uh, overlaid on the site the previous piers, two of them, and the two mangrove bridges that cross to the north, and where those sit, and I'll show you in a moment here how those overlay with those resources. So you see this black line that, that forms the kind of um, impact zone of the pier and the bridge crossings. And you see in this dark red and this light red the places where we were beginning to impact that mangrove and seagrass and beach landscape. And so this caused us and our whole team to kind of question the geometry of this and think about how can we model the number one principle from the community through the process of a blue and green oasis, a respectful ecological design process. That led us to a very different kind of pier, and I would argue probably not a pier any longer, but more of a pedestrian boardwalk that creates a kind of spiral, um, starting at the beach landscape, but at the back edge of it, tracing around the back edge of the beach, out past the seagrasses, and then back connecting to the Van Wezel. So we've moved from two bridges across the mangrove to one to minimize impact, and we've created a new form to the pier that we think, one, is just lovely um, and provides an incredible kind of view of the bay and its incredible skyline. And secondly, it has less impact on these important resources. We're excited by this because we also think it's an opportunity to build awareness of these resources um, and thinking about how we can have engaging moments of interpretation as you move along the, uh, the boardwalk out over the water to learn about the seagrasses and the mangrove. Here you see those two side by side. It's important that we do this little deep dive with you because this is really the most essential change since the master plan, but it's been driven by a real understanding of the science of this place and trying to live up to our promise to you to preserve the ecological resources of the site. Again, we think it just could be incredibly lovely to welcome, as you might imagine, strolls along the boardwalk at night, looking at the bay skyline and the incredible sunsets you have. We've been looking at moments to both step the pier so that it becomes a place to sit, not just pass by, but sit and be part of the experience of the bay, places where we could have netting out over the water for kids to be out over the water, over the seagrass potentially, um, places where we can let light through. And th this really becomes a kind of signature element of the Living and Learning Lab. Here you see it out on the waterfront. Really almost the majority, a lot, kind of 50% of it is not actually out over the bay. It's really on land, but it creates a kind of unified environment touching all of these different distinct resources. 
So uh, here it is in more detail. You see it along the back edge of the beach, going out over the water, connecting to the north, to Van Wezel, connecting back to the property, creating more connectivity along the waterfront as a, another important goal of the master plan. We also have experienced the project on the left is a project I worked on in Chicago on the river there, where we looked at not just the form of the pier, but also the underside and the infrastructure of it becoming actually ecologically driven. So in Chicago, we actually, there's the experience of what you experience as a human on the surface. And then under the water, we've made all of these different um, uh, fish habitat uh, connections. So ropes and um, all kinds of technical names like lunkers attached to the infrastructure to make space for fish and make it a kind of healthier environment. This project on the right is in Seattle waterfront where they wanted to build a new walkway over sensitive salmon habitat. And to do so, they built the walkway out of bits of glass, as you can see, kind of glass pavers that let light through uh, so to be less disruptive. We can imagine doing this in some of the zones of the pier um, that we are thinking about. There's also, as I mentioned, just lots of opportunities for interpretive experiences. We've created um, in this early concept two overlooks, one uh, oriented to the winter sunset, when the sun is the furthest south in the sky, one oriented uh, to the summer sunset, when it's the most north in the sky. So you can imagine it's almost like the boardwalk becomes a living sundial. And then on the inside edge, a seagrass classroom where we step down and welcome people to actually be part of the experience of that water um, and uh, learn about seagrasses. Here on the beach side, we have a few terraces that lead you down to that sandy um, beach and again, offer a great place to sit and enjoy the bay. Here's that ecological beach edge. So you see the kind of grasses and this boardwalk that kind of comes through and creates seating and opportunities to enjoy the view and this connection out onto the pier. The summer sunset overlook, we imagine furnishings that enable people to come and gather and picnic here. We're exploring right now the possibility of shade, kind of shaded cover to these spaces to really make them places you want to stay and linger. Um, uh, furnishings that really enable people to enjoy uh, being out over the water. And then importantly, you know, the, the, all of, um, all of the, the, the pier really links together a lot of different pieces, but Boulevard of the Arts is really our connective thread back to the community. We've seen that as a really important pedestrian corridor from day one of this project. And as we think about how it transitions from 41 out to the bay, we've thought about all of the ways we can make it a more walkable street introducing more crosswalks, uh, introducing bump outs that slow traffic, thinking about tighter, smaller lanes, the introduction of wider pedestrian walkways that lead you to the waterfront. So going from sometimes five or six foot wide walkways to more like 10 to really enable that connection. And then along the north, southern side of the project, along um, of phase one, we have this idea of a linear plaza, a 30 foot wide, continuous public walkway that takes you from the entrance of the project at Van Wezel Way to the bay, that along that walkway, shade structures that provide a whole series of outdoor rooms and spaces that welcome all kinds of different uh, pop-up and temporary uses. Uh, within that kind of landscape of this promenade, which you see here, which is sometimes shade structure, sometimes canopy from trees potentially, We've tucked in um, small facilities that really help to serve um, uh, the users uh, that come here. So restroom facility, the potential for pop-up food and beverage service. It came up in our earlier public meeting, a lot of questions around why the facilities, um, the restroom and the food and beverage was located on this eastern edge of the plaza. And that I just want to address very directly was for two basic reasons. One, um, this is uh, a place where um, future sea level rise and storm surge will have impacts during large events. And so we wanted to pull these facilities, which would have damage during a large event, as far away from the bay as possible, and also to give them a little bit more elevation to keep them out of that storm surge. And so that was really fundamental. But also was this idea that we didn't want a building blocking the view of the bay. We want the bay to be the thing we're celebrating. And so all of the open space has a continuous view to the water. So pulling the buildings back to this southeast corner allows the landscape to really celebrate that view. And there's nothing kind of blocking it. We think um, we worked really closely today with our um, wonderful architects here in town, uh, Spark Sweet Sparkman, um, about how to think about Sarasota's tradition of modern architecture, 
this beautiful, light, airy um, series of, of shade pavilions that I think will be familiar to you, shade making architectures, um, but how to evolve that to be more modern and contemporary. It's a very exciting opportunity to think about how to provide shade and beauty and icon to this park. And then we've been working to think through what are the scale of spaces under this shade structure, many of them, multiple, as we describe them, rooms, where different events can happen, where you can come just any day and lounge and be part of kind of movable tables and chairs, potentially hammocks, um, places for picnicking and barbecuing um, that could be out uh, at different times. Maybe sometimes there'll be small fitness classes like pop-up yoga happening under the shade structure or small markets or vendors. Really thinking again about this as a living and learning lab, something where we can keep, keep testing ideas through this first phase. We also talk about food and beverage service. We've talked to a lot of experts that deal in economically sustainable food and beverage service for parks in floodplains. That's a specialty, if you can believe it or not. Um, and they all tell us minimal amount of infrastructure, don't build a restaurant, don't build anything that's a significant piece of architecture. Really think about providing utilities and infrastructure, welcome lots of different food vendors to come in and out for different events, different kinds of events. Let it be kind of an incubator in the same way we think about the, the kind of programming, um, that the food is part of that. So we imagine something where you can come and get a kind of heat up sandwich. We imagine a place you can always get a drink, um, an alcoholic or otherwise, um, but we don't imagine a lot of fixed infrastructure. And this is uh, in development now. We also imagine these really essential park uses to support the life of the park. So everyone always asks, and yes, there'll be restrooms, and we've been challenged by our board to make them the most lovely public restrooms the world has ever seen. So yes, <laughs> you can clap for that. And I'll answer the other question everyone always asks, will there be parking? Um, we will actually remove about 57 spaces in phase one. You know there's an existing parking lot there today that will come out and be greened. Um, but we do still have, as you can see from this diagram, over um, 1,250 spaces existing within a five-minute walk of phase one, so that's a lot, uh, and another, another um, a couple hundred further north uh, and in the neighborhoods to the east. And so we feel comfortable that there's a good amount of parking to enable visits. And with that, I'll turn it to Susanna. Thank you, Gina, and thanks everyone for being here. Um, so we've heard about spaces of a few different scales, this sort of grand gesture of the pier that sort of delicately works its way around some ecological resources and these small uh, living rooms, let's call them, um, under the shade structure. Well, to the north of that is a, a sort of a, a slightly bigger scale space, um, and this is all part of creating, again, this living and learning lab where we can try different events and different activities in different spaces. And so we've got this two and a half acre lawn here, um, which is generous. Um, it can hold small to sort of medium size events. We're not talking about um, Central Park here, um, but we do have uh, the ability to do some really interesting and fun events. And we take inspiration from a number of places around the country and, and more closely here at, in, in Tampa, you can see in the upper left. Um, but again, this whole phase is about trying things out. You know, Sarasota doesn't have a park like this, so we don't know yet what is going to work. Um, and is it a temporary art installation, exercise classes, movie nights? We don't know, but we know that we give ourselves a space to tr try some things out. And in fact, we give ourselves spaces and sort of a, a, a structure to create, again, uh, like, like with the shade structure, we've got rooms under the shade structure. We have different areas of the lawn that can be used uh, for different events at the same time, whether that's a cornhole tournament uh, in one area and a sort of a pop-up playground in another area or beach bocce, um, or is it that movie night here where we set up a screen in the middle of the lawn and, and leave half of it open for people to do whatever they want if they're not involved in the movie, but then the rest sort of spill out from the screen with blankets and chairs and um, get to experience this place in a, in a totally different way from what they do now. Um, and a food festival, again, we don't want a fixed restaurant, um, 
we want to try different things and see what works. And so we know food festivals do really well in Sarasota. And so we've created a, a sort of a space along Boulevard of the Arts that might allow for a, a food festival to come in, tents to set up, people to spill out onto that lawn um, to really enjoy uh, the view and the food and um, each other's company. Another sort of green uh, asset that exists actually today, um, I don't know if, if many of you have experienced it, this is the existing pedestrian bridge that connects to the Van Wazel and <clears throat> if you get to the middle of that bridge you know there's this lovely uh, mangrove bayou that um, has tons of potential. Uh, it's, a, it's an amazing asset that we can sort of take advantage of right from the get-go. We don't have to build it, it's there. Uh, but what we do need to do is give it a, a sort of a fighting chance, give it a, a help improve the health of it. Um, it is currently fairly well polluted and taken over by some invasive species. And so um, one thing we can do pretty quickly is address those issues of um, the, the species that shouldn't be there, of sort of views in and out. You know, I, I mentioned the bridge because right now that's one of the only places you do get this nice long view of the mangrove. Well, the state of Florida allows for trimming, a removal of invasives, windowing into the mangrove so that you can see uh, from the path around it uh, into the space. Um, and we imagine a future where it's not just this sort of hidden gem, but something that people engage with from the water, from the land, um, for walking, for re re kayaking, uh, resting, relaxing. Um, but I mentioned that it's polluted, and I think we need to look at the reality of what's happening, which is that millions and millions of gallons of stormwater, these orange dashed lines you see here, um, are coming from the roads, from the parking lots, from the whole city, really, um, and emptying untreated into this mangrove. And we can't possibly handle that whole problem. Um, you know, we're gonna do what we can to fix it on our site. Um, but we really think if, if we're going to take all this time and attention to bring people to the mangrove and get them to understand the value of it, that we need to do what we can within our site to help improve its health and cleanliness. Um, and so you here see an existing section which looks at that situation where all of this sort of stormwater flowing in with polluted silt is accumulating. If you've been down there, you know the water's murky and you don't see much below the top few inches. Um, well, that's, that's polluted silt that we can um, eventually get rid of uh, with some dredging. Um, we can, under the statutes of the state of Florida, go in and pull invasives um, and then create a situation where right now with the existing path, you don't see the water, you don't really perceive it, but we can do windowing that um, really creates sort of a, a, a view shed into the mangrove. We're not removing the mangrove, but we're sort of selectively creating windows into it really. Um, and so you see in our improved section below, uh, the idea of that windowing, the idea that we've cleared out some of the polluted silt. Um, you see a walkway, and really importantly, what you see is, uh, and we have a number of ideas for this, stormwater treatment so that the water that is hitting surrounding parking lots and roadways isn't going straight into the, the mangrove bayou, but actually getting treated, whether it's through rain gardens and, and swales like we're showing here, or other sort of structures that we know the state of Florida um, is very sort of supportive of for treating bigger volumes of water than we can with a little swale like this. So we want to do what we can on this site to help a bigger kind of Sarasota-wide issue. And in addition to sort of uh, helping fix problems, we've got some really great uh, special elements along this. We don't want it to be a, a loop that you just walk and sort of uh, go home, um, but actually stop and enjoy it and really experience this environment in a way that you haven't been able to. So we have the, the mangrove bayou overlook, we have a kind of um, revamped kayak launch that we're imagining, um, and the coastal hammock grove. And so we'll show you um, what those moments might feel like. Um, we've got some sort of fanciful and playful um, images of, of those moments and um, really inspired by what we feel and see when we're in that space and um, imagining how much better it could be if you can access it from the water and access it from the land and sort of get an appreciation for wildlife and this really quiet, sheltered, um, lovely environment. Um, and the existing, there is, for, for those of you who've looked, there is a sort of an old dilapidated um, 
uh, boat launch in the mangrove. And the good news there is that um, because it's already in the water, we don't need to go through the process of re-permitting. We can improve it and make it better, make it more accessible. We've got ideas about how to um, allow for multiple people of different abilities to actually get into kayaks in a safe and sort of sheltered way. And then this hammock grove um, is this beautiful instance of, of palm trees that were actually sort of uh, left upland uh, when sort of land was filled in. And again, it's an existing asset, and we think that there are a number of ways we can get people into it to enjoy it um, without really creating a whole lot from scratch. It's about taking advantage of something that's there. And so, as I think we've, we've been saying, this is the living and learning lab. We have ideas about what we think can happen in the space, but we're really anxious to hear from all of you what you see. Like, what, what can you imagine happening here in this space that would bring you here? And not just once, and not just once a year, but, but daily and, and then nightly and, and um, different seasons. Um, and so, with that, I think we're going to... Do you want to... I think Bill has a few more things he wants to add. So a couple more quick things and then we'll jump to uh, questions and answers. Again, as I mentioned earlier, if you wouldn't mind filling out any questions that you have on those blank note cards, we're gonna pass them down to the center aisle here in a second and our staff will pick them up and we'll, uh, we'll answer as many as we can today and then those that we can't get to, we'll of course, uh, we'll add uh, to our website. One more thing I wanted to mention, we've gotten some feedback um, from a number of folks from several of our neighbors related to uh, the potential redesign of Boulevard of the Arts. Um, we have heard some feedback that at times when there is a stopped car on Boulevard of the Arts, the existing uh, design, of course, has a lane, a median, and then a lane, and on-street parking on both sides. When there's a vehicle stopped, whether it's a backup for valet or a stopped car, uh, people get trapped and they can't get out, and so they have to back up and go the wrong way down a one-way one lane and then back out. And so one of the suggestions that we made to uh, resolve that is to relocate the trees in the median to the sidewalk uh, to the north, uh, move the lane in so that you've got a more normal residential street so it's two-lane undivided so that you can safely check for oncoming traffic, move around the stop vehicle and, and, oops, excuse me, and move out. But we've also heard from some neighbors that are concerned about uh, the uh, relocation of those trees and modifying the median. And again, our, plan, our suggestion would be to relocate the trees into the park to provide shade for uh, the park users. Um, but I also want to mention that that is just one, one of what could be several different solutions. And our organization is wide open to collaborating with our community and the neighbors on whether that median stays gets modified uh, or a solution we haven't thought of yet. Again, ultimately the city and the city commission will make the decision on what to do about that component as well as all aspects of the park. And so I just wanted to clarify again today has been the first and second of these seven workshops over the next eight months and we'll continue to have a communi community conversation about that aspect as well as all of the elements in the park. Okay, so at this point if you wouldn't mind uh, filling out your cards and passing them to the middle aisle our staff's going to pick them up and then we'll start uh, answering those questions. And while we're doing that, the other thing, just one more time to emphasize, you've got also a, uh, a feedback form. If you could fill that out and deposit it on your, on your way out, that would be great. That form is also available online uh, uh, for anyone who can't be here, anyone that's watching on Facebook Live. Welcome if you're watching online, that form should be available. Um, and uh, again, any of your friends and neighbors that couldn't be here can, can go online, watch the presentation and, and fill out that form. Okay, so I'll start with a question. Are we planning a pedestrian overpass still uh, as a part, over 41 as a part of phase one? So our current plan shows right here 
a potential pedestrian overpass. Our master plan shows the potential of three pedestrian overpasses over US 41. Um, so in terms of the time, we, we do still have them in the master plan. We do think connectivity is, is critically important uh, to our neighborhoods and to the downtown, to the east and to the southeast. Um, and so we're suggesting that those roundabouts uh, the 10th Street and 14th Street roundabout actually should be open to traffic around the end of the year. Full completion will be spring, but open to traffic by the end of the year. And then the Fruitville roundabout is probably 15 to 18 months away. So we will have a really good chance to see how those roundabouts operate, how pedestrian traffic moves east and west. And once we evaluate that, we'll work with the city and city staff and the city commission on if and when we put pedestrian overpasses in. The reason we've taken it out of our phase one is first that. Second, we believe that the Department of Transportation will pay for both the roundabout and a pedestrian overpass, um, but the way that gets done is it's put in the fifth year of their five-year plan, the exercise they go through, and so construction funding is at least five years out. And so uh, we, we are still considering it. We're going to see how the roundabouts work, and then we'll uh, continue to evaluate uh, that as a possibility. So as um, we did at the last forum, a lot of questions, this whole stack, and I'm sure there's more related to changes. Oh, and breaking news, there's a few more, to um, the Boulevard of the Arts changes. And so I just want to walk through as much as I can to describe how we've thought about altering the road. First and foremost, I would say that um, east of Van Wazel Way, there's a lot of change that's coming. I think you all have seen that the Quay development is underway, under construction. And as part of that work, there are modifications that will eventually happen to Boulevard of the Arts. Uh, to the left of that is Autour, another development that will have also changes to Boulevard of the Arts. And then as Bill mentioned, longer term, there's the potential future roundabout. Um, so just to say, there's a lot of change coming to Boulevard of the Arts to begin with, and then we are just this last stretch from Van Wazel Way westward. Um, we have looked really carefully at uh, the street. We've also talked uh, with the community a lot about this idea of walkability. And walkability to us means a lot of things. It means great shaded pedestrian environments. There's, as Bill noted, there's shade today, but most of it falls in the street by the median street trees. And so we'd just like to see more trees in general to shade pedestrians as they connect. Some of the sidewalks are narrow today. And so we want to widen those and make them more gracious and hospitable for people. Um, there is uh, not a lot of great crossings of Boulevard of the Arts, or crossings misalign with curb ramps. It's a little bit unconsidered and uncoordinated, so the potential that we're starting to show is actually a coordinated series of crossings that make it a safer and better street. And then we've proposed this idea of a, making it a more traditional two-lane road to give a little bit more green space and shade to the edges, but also to traffic comet to make it so that people can't drive very fast with bump outs and crosswalks and more street trees and amenities. I think another um, one last piece is that we've talked a lot about the view and uh, promoting kind of views and clear access to the bay. And so by thinking about a road that actually has a more shared view shed, um, we think that that also could celebrate this as well. We know that there are a lot of residential uses to the south um, that are accessed by Boulevard of the Arts. If you don't know, Boulevard of the Arts is actually a street that continues here, goes down into these developments, and continues for quite a ways, servicing a lot of residential properties. And so that has to be preserved. We have to guarantee continuous access to all of those properties. We have to make sure, and we're working on this, that fire and um, police access is continuous and safe. And we also have to make sure, because that's um, ga so somewhat gated, a pri more private um, entrance, that vehicles that come down to the end of Boulevard of the Arts can turn around safely. It's kind of um, what exists today. There's a bit of a turnaround at the end, and we're preserving that for future um, use as well. So that's just to tell you all of this has been in service of these ideas of connectivity and walkability, of sustainability, of creating a more imageable, positive pedestrian environment. And, and slowing the cars and making the cars less present um, in the experience of this gateway to the bay. Uh, and sort of one more question related to that. So there's a question about have any traffic studies been performed related to existing and proposed conditions uh, on, in the park? And so um, the normal uh, stage at which the city does a, has a consultant do a traffic study is the site plan application stage. So 
once we get through this process, uh, hopefully around August, then we'll start the site plan application process, and so then the traffic study will occur um, this fall. Um, but we do have access to the existing counts for the road. We've been looking at that. We've also got access to the approved traffic studies uh, from the OTOUR and the Quay. And so we do understand uh, the movement that's going on. Um, and so, again, this will be an ongoing conversation uh, between the community, us, and the city over the next seven or eight months. There's a a good one here um, that we should have addressed if we didn't when we were speaking uh, asks about areas of the shade, uh, excuse me, areas of shade on the pier, um, which, you know, it, it mentions and we, we get sun, heat um, are, are here year round in Sarasota, maybe not for us, um, but here in Sarasota. So one of the things that we're working really carefully with Sweet Sparkman, the local architects on um, our shade structures for the pier that we can um, do something lovely and artful that provides shade and makes it comfortable at different times of days, but then also doesn't obstruct views. You know, we're trying to create these clear views from the lawn over the pier and out to the bay. Um, and so it'll be, it'll be careful, but that's our next round of study. And um, we, I think as soon as this sort of saw the light of day, we realized that's not going to be a fun pier a lot of the time without some shade. So yeah. we'll work on that. Absolutely. And related to the Pier 2, there's a question here about what material will be will the Sunset Pier be. And that is typically something as you move from sort of the general stage that we're at to something more specific, um, then we will evaluate different alternatives, think about their life cycle, the maintenance cost, what they cost to actually install them, and we will um, work with the city to make informed decisions about that. This question asks me, what would bring me to this spot and cause me to return? space changing exhibit or something that celebrates Overtown or Newtown residents history and contribution, any plans? Yes! <laughs> we have always wanted this to be a place that is, belongs to everyone in Sarasota, that everyone feels welcome and that there is program um, and activation that really speaks to the broadest possible cross-section of this community. And so to that end, if you have ideas about what kind of programming would get you to come to the park, please write them down. We take very seriously wanting to be open and inclusive. Um, and I think, you know, we have ideas about, and I, we showed you some of them, ways of thinking about activation of the site, but we can't know what we don't know, and that's why we've asked you today on the forum that we gave you, please tell us about the uses in this park that would draw you here. Very excited to test those ideas with you. A um, couple of questions about parking. Um, uh, again, how much parking will be in the, phase, in the first phase, and uh, will, uh, you know, how will you drop off canoes and kayaks? So I think, as Gina said, we're proposing actually reducing the amount of parking in the first phase by about 55 or 57 spaces. Um, that's for a couple of reasons. One, it reduces uh, the congestion uh, in terms of driving your car to the phase one and parking. The second thing is we've got uh, over 1,200 parking spaces within a three to five minute walk. And so we want to encourage folks to park in the perimeter and walk in. And so uh, for that reason, we're suggesting uh, removing about half of the parking in that current phase. There will be some sort of drop off. We are just starting to think about that in terms of canoes and kayaks, we're suggesting would have some sort of temporary parking to be able to come in, offload your kayak or, your kayak or paddleboard, uh, go elsewhere and park, and then launch and, uh, and then move around. So uh, that's our current thinking. Oh, and then one more question related to parking. Uh, what is the status of building a parking garage? Um, the approved master plan always anticipated, we evaluated early options on par parking garages in this area, but the master plan has always reflected surface parking. Uh, again, we're suggesting parallel parking on Boulevard of the Arch, which is there today, and we would retain that. Um, but the city has actually engaged a parking uh, consultant that's doing a neighborhood parking study and get, going to help uh, the New Performing Arts Center uh, Foundation and the city evaluate whether there should be a parking garage in support of the New Performing Arts Center, and if so, how big that should be and where it should be. So that's, again, stay tuned, that's ongoing. There's a question here, are there restrooms or food trucks located in any other areas within the project? Um, we don't know what the future holds for phases beyond phase one. We certainly feel like a small restroom facility is essential to a public space, especially that doesn't have 
real walkable access to anything that could provide that otherwise. And so that's always been sort of a baseline. And, and, and as we have said, we were, have been charged to make it a really exceptional restroom facility. And we know we have sort of operations uh, to help make it stay great. Um, food trucks are not something that are prolific in Sarasota, as we've learned. Um, there are a handful here and there, but I wouldn't say that it's been a major driver of the phase one design. We've really thought about this limited small piece of infrastructure that sits next to the restroom that could enable different concessionaires to come in and out potentially for different events. Um, there's certainly areas both in uh, outside of phase one where food trucks could certainly gather in within phase one, that parking lot on the, the small kind of um, eight to 10 space parking lot on the east end of phase one could be a great place for food trucks to come. And so um, we certainly wouldn't prohibit that, but we haven't had that be a major driver in the way we've thought about the public space to date. We've really focused on this idea of a limited amount of infrastructure to really enable this kind of incubator food uh, and beverage service. So a couple of questions here expressing concern about the uh, existing homeless population, uh, some of whom use the site. And um, you know, beyond that, just concern about security on the site. We've gotten questions about that. And so uh, this is something we deal with in all urban parks. Uh, there are a few things that we can do and we will deploy as a part of our design. One is to incorpor incorporate uh, design principles that make it a place that it's not easy for folks to hide, that's very visible, that's uh, well lit at night just from a safety standpoint. And uh, so that's certainly something that uh, design principles that we will uh, deploy. And then the other ways that you deal with it, we dealt with it up at the, uh, I was the project manager for the Bradenton Riverwalk. Um, and there was a, a substantial problem with that up at the Riverwalk. And in fact, the Courtyard Marriott, which is right in the middle of the Riverwalk and is only about a quarter mile from downtown, they used to tell their, uh, their visitors, uh, don't walk along the waterfront to downtown, it's not safe, take a taxi um, and to go to downtown. Um, but once we were completed the project, we incorporated the design principles, we lit it, and then just by the, the fact that there is activity along the Riverwalk, it has made it a safe place to be. And so now folks move up and down uh, the Riverwalk. And then the last piece of it uh, is that we anticipate deploying a combination of park ambassadors uh, who would provide extra sort of eyes on the activity that's going on in the park, armed with uh, walkie-talkies. Uh, so that they can, uh, you know, call for help if they need it. And then up at the Riverwalk, we actually paid a little extra to get a, a extra police on uh, bicycles. And so they patrol it, uh, and uh, they also say hello to visitors. Um, but that, there's a multi, uh, you know, sort of phased way that we can help address that that's proven uh, in this kind of an urban park. I've got a, a timely one here, given our schedule for tomorrow. Uh, it asks about the boardwalk's ability to function in coordination with the reef for storm surge protection. Um, and so I think we're interested in exploring ideas like this for sure. I mean, we've talked a lot about um, the potential for creating habitat underwater. Um, Bill's got a VOG, yes. vertical oyster garden. garden. Uh, sample hanging in his office if anyone wants to go look at it. There's no oysters there yet, just the shells. But, um, you know, I think to the extent that we can do more than just create habitat, but actually create protection, we're, uh, we're all ears. And so we're meeting um, first thing tomorrow with our um, marine engineer, Moffat and Nickel, uh, among the best in, in the world, really, um, along with a handful um, of environmentalists locally who forms an environmental working group for um, the, the Park Conservancy um, to kind of put both kind of the engineering minds and the envir environmental minds together to figure out what, um, what can give us maximum benefit in terms of public access but also habitat and protection of the shoreline. So, so someone said, not a question, a statement. You've gone above and beyond at every step of the way. So thank you, Boo, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> whoever you are. Thank you. Um, and um, I love all the different seating viewing areas. Can you tell us if these areas will be able to change with the seasons? That's a lovely idea. I think every park um, that I've ever worked on has, a, we always call it a seating portfolio, a diverse seating portfolio, places that are fixed, that are reliable, that offer 
basic uh, sitting and resting based on spacing. Um, we offer, um, we would like to offer different kinds that are changeable. You saw the hammocks, a very unusual kind of public space amenity that we think could be really lovely. Um, and then, you know, the, the whole notion of the linear plaza along Boulevard of the Arts is this idea that there could be this constantly changing furniture, that we could try things and see what works, Adirondack chairs, uh, tables and chairs, uh, potentially a small bar. So, so these sorts of things, yes. And, and ideally, um, give us lots of different ways of experiencing the landscape from the pier to the mangrove, uh, to the real urban edge, and, and everything in between. So thank you for that question. Another question about uh, the overpass over US 41. Uh, some detailed questions about where will it connect, how high will it be, how far will it extend. What I can tell you is, as I mentioned, uh, we're going to let the, the roundabouts uh, get in place and see how they operate and then evaluate from there. But we have had our traffic consultant do an a, a feasibility study on all three locations, and it fits in all three locations, uh, including Boulevard of the Arts. So we know it's functionally can fit. Now we're going to see how the roundabouts operate, and then we'll come back to that and uh, you know, do more detail at the right time. Um, and then another question about when will phase one be complete. Uh, we're, as you can see, moving through the design process. We'll be through uh, the uh, implementation plan process and the site plan application process early next year, February or so. Um, and then we'll submit for building permits, break ground with a little luck this time next year, maybe a little bit later, maybe in the fall. Uh, and so we're about two and a half years or so from cutting the ribbon on the first phase, but we're, we are moving ahead. Yeah, so um, there's a question, a uh, good question about what's, uh, what's the status of the fishing pier or a fishing pier um, and is a part of the Sunset Pier. And so we're currently evaluating that. Currently, as um, some of you may know, there's fishing that goes on um, along the waterfront edge, but then also out on the purple water intake pier um, that exists. Um, and so we've got uh, several uh, fishermen and we've also got a boater working group and an environmental working group that's helping us think about fishing. We're, we're hoping to incorporate fishing into the pier, um, and, but we're, because that's a fun activity for, you know, for families and for our community, uh, and it's also a fun thing to watch. But we also recognize that there can be some safety concerns about um, you know, casting a treble hook uh, where you've got folks walking by. And so we're thinking about that. We've got a consulting team evaluating how do we, can it be on the pier? Can it be separate? Is it a different elevation? Can we do things with the, to encourage marine life underneath uh, and prohibit casting, but encourage there to be good fishing, you know, straight down. And so we're thinking about that and fishing, we will definitely have fishing uh, as a part of our park. We're just trying to evaluate and do it in a way that's appropriate and, and uh, you know, makes sense. Yeah, and there were also some questions about boating and boating's relationship to the pier. And so for those of you that were part of the master planning process, you might remember that we had a boating diagram at one point that talked about where different kinds of boating was most appropriate across the 53 acres. So all of the kind of heavy boating, bigger recreational boats, motorized boats are all to the north because we have the existing boat ramp, we have the significant parking supply to the north there. And this pier, this boardwalk out on the water, and this experience of the mangrove has made us consistently, and to this day, want to keep all of the boats that are launched here, human-powered craft, non-motorized. We're not designing the pier to be a place for recreational boats to tie up with motors. Um, we are not prohibiting that potential use, because there may be some programming ideas we want to test that will require boats to be able to dock there, but it's not something that we're building into the program at all. Um, yeah. We also have been asked about programming for children and whether that will be part of the um, part of the plan. And yes, absolutely. I think whether it's uh, movie night or kid yoga classes under the tr shade structure, um, those things will certainly be in the mix. Uh, we've also talked about an idea of a small experimental play space that could have kind of changing um, pop-up play. This is a kind of phenomenon that's sweeping the country where you know kids get bored if they just.